I first met this morning's speaker, Mark Larson, when he was working as an English teacher at Evanston Township High School, and I was a student working in the high school's daycare center, which his twin daughters attended. During his 14-year tenure at ETHS, he received the Golden Apple Award for Excellence in Teaching. He has served as Manager of Partnerships at the Field Museum of Chicago and Director of Education at the Lincoln Park Zoo. More recently, he served as Assistant Professor and Director of Partnerships at National Lewis University before retiring in 2015. Before beginning a career in education, he worked in theater and television as a special assistant to Burt Hillstrom, creator of the 50s television program Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. He also worked for a short stint as a driver for Carol Channing. Inspired by the work of Studs Terkel, Mark began collecting the stories of others in 2012 and has been doing so ever since. He's currently an interviewer and curator for AmericanStoriesContinuum.com, which compiles his conversations across the country about life in 21st century America. Today, he'll be sharing with us stories from his current project about the Chicago theater scene. Please help me welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was so thrilled to be invited to thank you, Sherry, to uh, the ethical humanist. Who could not like ethical humanist? I, I just like the sound of it. And so, um, especially because um, this is my f the first time giving this particular presentation. This is a, a very much a work in progress. It's a book I'm working on right now about Chicago theater. And um, it won't come out until uh, spring of 2018. So order now. You know, <laughs> uh, advance order now. Um, but so I'm bringing you into the process of this very early, on, very early on. In fact, you're the very first people, you ethical humanists, you, to hear what I'm about to present. So I hope it goes okay, and I, I hope that you will bear with me as I kind of find my way through this process. Um, that actually is quite in keeping with the nature of the book I'm doing. Um, the idea of drawing you into the process. What I've learned is that prior to 1953, there was very little theater in Chicago at all. There were some outlying things. There were mostly touring companies coming to Chicago from New York. Starting in 1953, which is when I started too, I'm the exact age of the Chicago theater movement, starting then, and tracking through, it's been fascinating for me to discover how this theater town came into being. There are now, I don't know if you know this, there are now 250 theater companies in Chicago. And depending on how you count them, there could be more. I asked Deb Clapp, who is the head of the uh, League of Chicago Theaters, how many theaters, she said at least 250. And depending on how you count them, maybe 300. They all support each other like an ecosystem, which is very unusual. I've talked to people who have gone off to LA and to New York, and they say nowhere is it like in Chicago, where everybody supports everybody else. It's like that um, rising tides lifts all boats thing. They all believe that. Barbara Gaines, who started the Chicago Shakespeare Theater, um, has you know she's very successful right now out on Navy Pier. Somebody recently told me that when they opened their building, they got a note from Barbara Gaines, and Barbara Gaines said, this is great for all of us. And that's the spirit of, of Chicago theater. So what I'm doing is tracking how this came into being, the making of a theater town, which is now has international, international profile. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, for example, you start in 1975. There were other things prior to that. But how, does, how do you get from this, right? Some kids doing a play in a church basement to this. How does this happen? How does this happen? Jackie Taylor performing wherever she can, black theater ensemble, and it comes up to this. This is Andy White. Some of you may know him. He's an Evanstonian. <clears throat> He's one of the co-founders of um, Looking Glass Theater. 
That started when a small group of friends at Northwestern, seven people, decided to do a play, Alice in Wonderland, that David Schwimmer wanted to do. They were all students together. They kind of broke with the tradition of, the, of, the, of Northwestern itself and did this play. And that became the basis of Looking Glass Theater. Andy, looking a little scruffy there, he was, uh, I caught him between shows. Um, he was doing Treasure Island, so that's why he's all bearded, scruffy looking. Um, that's the po whoa, somebody should have told me that's that short. That's the uh, poster from Alice in Wonderland, their very first show. This is where they are now, at a Chicago landmark. That astonishes me. And again, in a short amount of time, Writer's Theater in the 90s was performing in the back of a bookstore in Glencoe. In the back of a bookstore. This would look like a huge auditorium to them. The back of a bookstore. This year they opened this in Glencoe, which is a gorgeous space. Barbara Gaines, who I mentioned, she got it into her head she wanted to do Henry V. She had no place to do it. She went to the Red Lion Pub on Lincoln Avenue, said, can I do it in your rooftop garden? And this is where she is now. And that's expanding. So what is it about this place? And what is it about this gathering of people that makes this happen, right? So that's sort of on the macro level. On the, on, the, uh, on the more micro level, this is George Went in Second City, 1976, I think. And then this. Remember Norm? That's Michael Shannon. Michael Shannon now is an Academy Award nominee, a Tony nominee. He has more movies to his name than I can even list. That's him at about 17 or 18, performing at the next theater in Evanston, Illinois. Killer Joe, which was Tracy Letts, first play that nobody wanted to do. They did it in a small classroom at the Noise Cultural Center. And here he is today, meeting the president. <laughs> How's that happen? And they all have a tremendous loyalty to Chicago. So what I'm going to share with you today is some clips. None is more than two minutes, except the one with Michael Shannon. It's like two and a half. But I want to give you a sense of what they're telling me about this process. Now, what I've been looking for to drive the narrative forward is moments, moments of transformation or pivotal moments. Moments when it changed everything for people. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, is some clips of moments, right? I've talked to almost 200 people. 186 is my last count. By the time the book is finished, it'll be well over 200. Some you know, this is Bill Peterson, who has a rich history in um, Chicago theater. But now he's, he, he's just finished doing CSI. And that's, I think that's what he's doing, is being the CSI guy. David Schwimmer went on to Friends and numerous movies. Started here. You'll hear his voice. This is, uh, you may not know his face, but he's the co-author of Grease. And his whole career has been based on that. Jim Jacobs. I met him in San Diego at that corner bakery. Joe Mantegna, now on Criminal Minds, but is the first person, one of the first people, um, who read David Mamet's American Buffalo, which is now part of the kind of the lexicon, of, or I mean the, uh, the canon of American theater. David came up to him and said, will you read this? I just need to hear it. And that was Joey Mantegna. Michael Shannon, Boardwalk Empire, who I just mentioned. Ed Asner, I went out to his house in LA just outside of LA. And you'll hear a little bit about him from Ed, too. And uh, Fran Guinan, one of the staples of uh, Steppenwolf Theater. He's been there almost from the beginning. Tim Kazarinsky, Saturday Night Live, Police Academy. <laughs> but there are people that you don't know. And in the spirit of ensemble, where everybody is important, not just the stars, 
you're going to hear voices from people who you don't know, too. Because they're all part of it. They're all part of the ensemble. Let me illustrate this with an example. When you go to New York and you go to a Broadway show, the star walks out and everybody applauds. It's called entrance applause. Here, Michael Shannon, who has all this acclaim right now, walks into an 80-seat theater, Red Orchid. Not a, not a sound, not because they don't like him, because we just don't do that. It's all, all part of the ensemble. So everybody gets an equal voice in my book. This is Larry Hart, who is a sound designer. He was an actor in the beginning, now he's a sound designer. He also designed posters for the Organic Theater Company. Cookie Gluck, which was a wonderful name. She's an Evanstonian, too. Um, Cookie was costume designer for the Organic Theater and got a Tony nomination for Warp, the costumes that she did for Warp when it went to New York, even though it was one week that it closed. This woman is fascinating. I just met her. Margie Marcus. She went to see Glass Menagerie at the Highland Park Theater, or Highland Park Theater, there's an interesting slip. Steppenwolf Theater in Highland Park when it was in the basement. Glass Menagerie, she loved it so much, she called the theater and she said, I've got to do something with you. Let me know what I can do. John Malkovich and Gary Sinise took her out to lunch and said, they said, do you want to be on our board? And at that time, the board was maybe two other people. So she was on their board for nine years and she's a devoted fan to this day. If you don't know this young woman now, you're going to. Her name is Carolyn Heffernan. She was in Annie out at the Paramount Theater. It's this gargantuan Paramount Theater. And she was also in a, the first, um, the premiere of David Rabe's play, Good for Otto, in a, in a theater that seats 40. She's an immensely talented young lady. Other person you may not know, but if you were reading the reader back in the day and read the criticism, you know, theater criticism, this is Lenny Kleinfeld, who went by the name Barry St. Edmund at that time. He also co-wrote co co Warp. Colin Cordwell, owner of the Red Lion uh, Tavern where Barbara Gaines did her thing, um, Henry V. Ted May gave a red orchid its name. This woman, born to a circus family, worked, you know, grew up in a circus family, traveled all around, became part of the Wrigley Brothers Circus, and in her own words, I'm not, you know, I'm not making this up, in her own words, she said, I married a clown and moved to Chicago. <laughs> but is that, that's sort of interesting. She married a clown and ran away from the circus. What she does now, if you've ever seen Looking Glass Theater, with all the trapezes and all the flying, she works very closely with them on that. But you don't often hear her name. Two sound designers. They've done a ton of stuff around the city. If you've been to the theater in Chicago, you've heard their sound. Polly Penn, if you know Greece, she was the very first Patty when it was done at the Kingston Mines here in Chicago. And this woman, I don't know if you can tell, but I love talking to this woman. Her name is Donna Dunlap. Rick Cogan said I had to talk to Donna Dunlap, and I never otherwise would have even been aware of her. Donna Dunlap owned a pet store. I think it was on Lincoln Avenue. Loved the theater, and theater people would just hang out at her pet store, and she'd give them work. So she's a much beloved figure in Chicago theater. The other thing about Donna is she was a very close friend of Warren Casey's, and Warren Casey is the co-author of Grease. And I don't know if you know the songs from Grease, but she was driving home with Warren one night, and it was raining and so forth. And she saw these high school kids out on their, on their, on their prom. And she, they were all huddled under an, a canopy. And she goes, oh, look, it's raining on prom night. And that became one of the signature songs of Greece. So Donna Dunlap was one of the first people in the world to hear the songs from Greece, because Warren would sing them to her. So those are some of the people, right? Now I'll play some clips. I, want, I, I kept looking for where should this begin? Where does my story begin? And at first I thought it was going to start in the 60s with Bob Sickinger and Hull House. Then I thought maybe 75 with Steppenwolf. 
And then I met Joyce Piven, if you know Joyce Piven. She goes back to 1953, University of Chicago, when almost nothing else is going on in Chicago. She met Paul Sills, Mike Nichols, Ed Asner, Elaine May, all these people, and they created what's called the Playwrights Theater Club. And that, I think, is the beginning of the movement. At least that's what I mark as the beginning of the movement. That happened when I talked to Joyce and went up to her apartment. I've been up there three or four times now. And she said things like what I'm going to play for you now. Listen what's important to her. We were having lunch, so her first words are a little garbled. The first thing she says is, I'm the last one standing, meaning from back in 53. So she says that. And the other voice is an actor named Larry Grimm. So he was there having lunch with us. Let's see if this sound works. And the reason I keep coming back to you is because I think this I'm is... I'm the last one I was standing. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that who's still here in Chicago, too. Yeah. It's just, well, okay, one more quote. <laughs> this is Bill Williams, you know, Albert Williams. He used to be like the head uh, critic at the uh, reader for a number of years. Oh, okay. Sort of during the heyday, during right. 80. Oh. He's, a, he's a very, okay. he adores you and, and yeah. your legacy too. He really does. Um, uh, but I said, when I sit down, this is me, when I sit down to talk to Joyce Piven, and then he interrupted me and he said, that's the lifetime. That is the whole lifetime of Chicago theater. Wow. That's the lifetime. Because if you think about before playwrights... There was nothing. There was nothing. It, there, was, there was a couple. Mm -hmm. I heard about them, but I, again, I was young. I didn't want to hear about that. We were creating a new theater. We wanted to be original and revolutionary. And that's what I think... That's what it was? That's uh, what I think it was. But I think that's why people in theater don't want to look back. I'm very pleased that Bob has. That's nice to know because I had been reaching a time in my life where my feeling was when I'm gone, there are going to be a lot of memorials. Mm -hmm. And I'm here now. Yes. And and people are going to be digging that up. And, you know, it was, uh, I had a what's it all for moment. What's it all for? You know. Um, How do you? And I'm not sure what it is I want. I just want, I, I would like for people in the theater to acknowledge their roots. And Bob does know. I didn't set that up well. She's referring to Bob Falls, and I had read her uh, a quick uh, quote from my interview with Bob that mentioned her and the le her legacy, and that's what she's referring to. But you can hear how adamant she is that people acknowledge their roots and that this story continues, right? Um, and the other thing that just struck me, and I, I heard it again as I was listening to this, is she slammed her hand on the table and said, I'm here now. I want to tell my story now. So I keep going back to talk to her. Very interesting person. This is Nick Ruddle, who I recently met. Nick is... Um, uh, he was the artistic director at the Court Theater when they built their building out on the south side of Chicago. And Nick identified, remember, I'm, I'm looking for moments now. Nick identified a moment in the 70s as really interesting. And so let's hear what Nick has to say. I remember that a friend of Philip Roth managed to get Claire Bloom to mm. come here to perform scenes of women in Shakespeare in Mandel Hall, and uh, the place was packed. The number of seats was notorious. It was 1066, mm -hmm. and there were 1066 people in there. Mm -hmm. 
and I won't say his name because he's dead now and he was a friend of mine, but he introduced Claire Vu as coming into this desert of theater. The place fucking exploded <laughs> in booze because it was, uh, and she was devastated, uh, but he was a writer. But it was already there, in other words. Yeah. That was... Uh, but only Chicago knew it at that time. That's right. Because it was something like... This is 19... It's before 1980. So it's in the mid to late 70s that this happened. So, so I've always remembered that, that That's the people in the theater booed when the introducer of Claire Boom set was gracefully greeting her into this desert of theater. And they, everyone knew it's not that. It's different. That really marks it in time, too, in our history, doesn't it? Yeah. That we knew it, but the world didn't know no. it yet. It was that moment. Yeah. That's really an interesting moment to me, and it's not that long ago when Claire Blue comes to Chicago. She's introduced by a gentleman who says, Here's Claire Bloom and coming into this theater desert, Chicago. This is the 80s. And appropriately, as Nick said, everybody roundly booed it. Roundly booed it. But it's a moment because we knew what we had. It was burgeoning. It was beginning to happen. But the rest of the world didn't yet. Well, they would come to know it. Here's a younger generation on the same kind of subject. This is Billy Peterson, who I mentioned, he was in CSI. But in Chicago in the 70s, he was scrounging around like everybody else for a place to work. And he identified an interesting moment that I want to share with you. That's Billy. It was us trying to just figure out where you could do plays and who was doing them. And it's so embryonic, all of that. It really was. And, and I, I remember very specifically, uh, a, a great moment where at the Victory Gardens in the downstairs theater, which is now a concert hall or something, uh, they had a symposium. Dennis called together a few guys, uh, and it, it was presented by Actors' Equity. And it was a symposium for actors, working actors, in the off-loop, people who wanted to work in the off-loop. And, and it was Mike Nussbaum and Bill Norris and... This lady who I'll never remember her name, but she was doing a lot of stuff like at Candlelight and Drury Lane, you know, much more commercial sort of stuff, mm -hmm. dinner theater stuff. And it was the three of them up on stage, and then it was a whole bunch of actors sitting in the audience on a Saturday afternoon. And it was, you know, it was questions for them and talking to them about, you know, how, what's the best way to go about trying to carve out a, a way to make some kind of living there. And I remember Mike Nussbaum very specifically saying, um, you know, here in Chicago, everybody gets a little taste and they get a little training and then they all dance off to New York or L.A. And he said, the only way that we can ever build a place to sustain artists is if we stay. Mm. And I, I remember, I didn't know, I had never seen Mike other than that at that point. You know, I, I'd heard of him. I knew that he was a, an actor, big deal actor, around at that time, and but I'd never seen him on stage, and uh, and I remember going, it just pierced me. It was like so profoundly right, uh, you know that that I it was a it was a big afternoon, you know. It was like you know, and that's when I think the seeds were planted in me to want to have our own theater company, which eventually yeah. came remains. And, uh, you know, I thought, it was the first time I thought to myself, you know what, maybe we can do this. Maybe, maybe I can be in Chicago and somehow figure out a way to make a living doing this and not have to hang drapes or pump gas, you know. That's so interesting to me, too. When you think of 250 theaters in Chicago right now, that there was a time when Billy goes, gosh, I wonder if I could do this. Mike Nussbaum saying... We need to stay. It was always a launch pad. You sort of do stuff in Chicago, but then you go off to New York, you go off to L.A. What if Chicago was the destination? It is now. When I talk to new theater companies, 
I say, what brought you to Chicago? And they go, Steppenwolf, the theater scene. They came here for it. But at that time, it wasn't there. It wasn't a gravitational pull. I love that moment. I love that moment. Um, this is Michael Shannon now. And he absolutely fascinates me. He's a bit of an odd person, which he admits to in this clip. But he's very famous now, as I mentioned. And I asked him about fame in the beginning. And he talks about whether he would leave for New York or leave for somewhere else. So he talks about fame and how ambivalent he was to it. And you sort of get the sense that he still is. So listen to Michael. This, this one's, I think, two and a half minutes. It's just a little longer. But I just love following his train of thought. In those real early days, were you thinking about fame? Was that part of a goal? What no. was driving you? No. You know, I would, I would, I would have friends or colleagues or acquaintances, and that would say they were moving to New York or LA to try and take it to the next level or whatever. Because it was hard. It's hard here. You don't. There's very few people that make a living strictly doing their art here. You know, even yeah. the successful people, uh, even the people that are highly thought of, they usually have to do something else in order to get by and. That can be a grind, you know. So people would say, you know, I'm going to try and make the big time or whatever. And, and to me, that always seemed like such a bad idea. Like I was never, <laughs> I didn't want to leave. I didn't think I would leave. And I didn't think about the future very much. I tried to think about as little as possible. Because I was kind of a, a misfit, you know. I knew when I was young that I was not going to have a conventional life. It just just wasn't in the cards for me. I just didn't. I wasn't comfortable with the notion of going through the same steps and phases that other people seem to go through. And I really just kind of the most important thing to me every day was that night's performance. Like everything revolved around that until that happened. And then the farthest I would think about in the future would be tomorrow night's performance. So I, I didn't think, I, I, I did not think, I mean, and people would even say, that, you know, someone like Jane or whatever would be like, you, you know, you're going to, you got something, kid. Or I'd be like, well, maybe, I don't know, but I might not even be interested in finding out. <laughs> That's an incredible last line to me. <laughs> Two other things about Michael Shannon that I found fascinating. Right after this, I said, what thought were you giving to how you would support yourself in the future? And he goes, I, I have a Peter Pan complex. I just didn't think about it. I just didn't think about it. Now he doesn't have to think about it, but... Um, the other thing that's interesting about him is he's a co-founder of a Red Orchid Theater, 80 seats. They've, there's in the same theater they've always been when Michael was unknown. Michael continues to come back and perform there. That's where I met with him, is at Red Orchid. And he said, you know, people say to me, it's so nice of you to come back here and help support. He said, I'm not doing anybody any favors. Sometimes I sit on the stage and I just think about all the stuff that's happened here. He used to sleep in there sometimes. All the stuff that's happened here. And I come back because this reminds me of who I am and where I came from. So he loves doing it, that devotion to Chicago. David Schwimmer actually is another interesting case. Started at Northwestern, helped found Looking Glass Theater, went, went to L.A. and almost almost immediately got Friends, you know, that show, that uh, sitcom Friends. And everything changed for him. But he has stayed very committed to Looking Glass Theater, too. Uh, some of the Looking Glass told me, Looking Glass folks told me, there's an interesting thing. They used to tithe their salaries. So if I was a waiter and I was making such and such, uh, let's say 200 bucks in a, in a week, 100 bucks in a week, I'd give them 10% of that. That was the commitment. So when Andy White went off and got a TV series, or David Schwimmer got 
uh, friends and some movies. That's a significant tithing, right? So 10% of that bought their lights and so forth. So that was that commitment. But David came here for the Cherubs program. Do you know the Cherubs program at Northwestern? I'm seeing some nuts. Some high school kids from all over the country are able to come and study theater at Northwestern. And so many people talk about that. People who you know, are successful now talk about the Cherubs program. So I asked David, what is it about the Cherubs program that stays with you? And this is what he said. Is there any part of the Cherub program that stays with you? I think in any, it was, it was the, the feeling of being in a collective or a, a, hmm. a concentrated group of people that were all, from all parts of the country who were dying to do this, who were passionate about this one thing. Hmm. Um, and that was, I think, the biggest impression. It's like, wow, we are all, like the energy of all these people in one room and then in hmm. several rooms and then in one large theater um, was dedicated towards this one thing, which is theater making. Um, uh -huh. And that wasn't, it wasn't about film or TV, or it was just theater making. And, um, and our bodies, which we were all, you know, <laughs> we were all going through adolescence and, and, <laughs> and puberty. Yeah. And so it was, um, you know, you're highly aware of your own body anyway. So it was a very, and, and, and all our hormone, hormones and testosterone, everything was just, you know, at full throttle. So, you yeah. know what I mean? So it's that yeah. energy of all these people not only already kind of bursting with this kind of, um, this chemical cha change happening, um, but also with this passion for one thing. Well, so, beautiful when we talk about it. This passion for one thing is what I hear across the board from theater companies here in Chicago. They're just devoted to the work itself. It's not like, how do I get famous or how do I you know, move from here? It's the, this dedication to the work itself. And that's what David's talking about that. And that's where it started to take root in him too. This idea of working as an ensemble. I told you this is my first time through, sorry. Um, Here's two quick ones. I like origin stories. I like hearing where things came from, especially things that are very securely part of our landscape now. Do you know the Victory Gardens Theater in Chicago? It's been around a long time. I always thought that was a neat name. We're going to hear how it got its name. Kingston Mines, which we now think of as kind of a blues club, was originally a theater. And we're going to hear how it got its name as well. Um, always humble beginnings, these things. This will, this will be Cecil O'Neill, who is one of the co-founders of uh, Victory Gardens. It's a little garbled at the beginning, too, but he says it, it happened at our first meeting. Well, it was that first afternoon, that first meeting, and we were knocking around names. And uh, What were you looking for? We didn't know. <laughs> we had no idea. And someone... Don't ask me how this came up in conversation. Okay. But someone said something about rutabaga. <laughs> and I would have someone asked else you. says, someone else says, what, what are rutabaga? <laughs> and someone said, oh, I don't know. That's something they used to grow in Victory Gardens. <laughs> and Warren Casey said, that's it. Victory Gardens. That's the name. <laughs> <laughs> Just because that's how I get stuck. It did it. It doesn't sound like you liked anything more than the sound of it. It didn't have any connection to like the war no. effort and all of that. No, it was just the sound of it. Just the sound of it. Yeah. Wow. Somebody at a meeting says something about rutabaga, and Warren Casey, who was the co-author of Greece, picked up on the Victory Garden thing, and that's what stuck. King, this is uh, Jack Wallace, a great old actor. He's been around forever. You remember Jack? He, if you went to see Chicago theater, especially in the 70s, you saw Jack. You couldn't avoid Jack. He was in everything. He did a lot of work with David Mamet, then went to L.A. and has made movies and so forth. But Jack is this great old raconteur. 
Kingston Mines, it turns out, is the name of the town where his father was a coal miner. And that's how it got its name. They were, they were trying to think of big, grandiose names, and then this is how that developed. It's where Greece started, too, Kingston Mines, sorry. We were looking for a name for the Kingston Mines. And I said, well, how about the New York uh, Repertory uh, uh, Theater? Because we're going to we're gonna have a repertory company. In it. And she said, no, no, they got that. Uh, somebody's got that, you know. And I thought, well, where would, the, where would the most unlikely place be to have a, a theater repertory company? And I thought... The Kingston Mines. Why not? <laughs> you know, there's nothing down there. There's about there was about 600 people that lived down there, and they were all re related to to each other. You know, and there was a mm. river that passed by. And... Did everybody else see it as a great name then? I mean, did, did, did... yeah, yeah, they didn't know what to think. <laughs> <laughs> the actors, they couldn't think. What, what yeah, they, they could think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. They thought it was. They thought it was. I don't know. And it's it sort of stuck. I, I was proud of that, you know. Yeah. And so, and well, my dad was proud of it too when, when uh, when he found out that uh, we named the theater after his hometown. Next time you pass the Victory Gardens or see an ad or Kingston Mines, remember where where the name came from. Jack is a great. Oh, I just so enjoyed talking to Jack because he just loves to tell stories. And he he has a, he gets a big chuckle out of it himself, but uh, he's a great guy. He, I have one more brief clip from him just in a few minutes um, when he took his father to the Esquire Theater because his name was up on the marquee. Okay. At the Goodman Theater, there's an associate director there named Chuck Spence. And in terms of moments and origins of things, this is when he really caught on to what theater was about. He, he said he was just sort of playing around with theater previously, just doing stuff. But then it clicked for him, and this is how. When I saw a uh, production of, I think, uh, I'm trying to think of what was the first time I saw Raisin and the Sun, but whenever, uh, whatever that was, that's, uh, that was, that was when I understood what the connection between theater and the audience. Because huh. I saw, I knew the kid, I knew, I knew the, that's who I, I identified with that kid. Because I knew that kid. Did I tell you this? How did I tell you this? How did you know this? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> I've, read about, I've read about you. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, when I first saw Raising the Sun, the conversation that that kid was having with his mom at the breakfast table was like, oh, wow. Hmm. I had that conversation with him. That's the same conversation I had with my mom, you know. Trying to get money to go to da 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 da, take me da da da, and eat your breakfast, Charles. Da 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 da, <laughs> not all that, you know. Yeah. That very calm. And the kid slept on his grandmama's couch, which is the same thing I did, you know. Uh, our situation was not ex the exact same situation, but there was enough there that made that really grabbed my attention, and I says, "Oh wow, that's heavy." Yeah. You know, and I was able to relate to that and I said, okay, now I get it. I get what this theater thing is about, you know. You connect with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you know. You find something that the audience can grab to and then from that on, then you got a book. And identify with. Yes, it. yes. Wow, yeah. that, that sounds like a significant turn. It point. was, it was. I mean, I was, and to this day, Raising the Sun is my favorite place. Yeah. You know, and it's mainly because of that, that moment, you know. Because that's the moment it got me. And other, otherwise, it, up to that time, it was just, ah, that nah, was fun. Nah, 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 nah. But then I said, okay, now I see the power of this thing. You know? Saw the power of it. Yeah. That moment when I saw the power of what theater can do. And like I say, now he's the associate director at the Goodman Theater and passing this on. But it's so cool to me to hear somebody identify that moment for themselves. Well, here's, here's another one. This is Billy Peterson. He did a play called In the Belly of the Beast, and that's when things really started to take off for him. In the Belly of the Beast was about a real criminal. You're remembering a lot of stuff. You saw it? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. We have to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you. We pregame such stuff. I knew Paul Stills from the time he was a teenager. 
we are going to definitely talk. <laughs> we are definitely going to talk. Um, Belly of the Beast, which they saw, um, he, he played a prisoner, a real prisoner. And he, he was famous for having beat his head against this file cabinet uh, so hard that he gave him a con he himself a concussion a couple times. He just threw himself into this role. But it took off from Wisdom Bridge onward, Kennedy Center, Europe, and then his career kind of took off like lightning after that. But I asked him, because I'm looking for moments, I asked him when he first discovered Jack Abbott's character. When did he find it? And he talked about how he and, and Bob Falls, the director, were the only ones in the room for the longest time. And this is how he discovered that character. Did you remember a moment when you found him? Well, I remember uh, it was just he and I in the theater one afternoon. Um, and there was a, I think he had a, I had a monologue about how to, how you kill somebody, mm. what it's like to stab somebody to death. And, uh, I had been, you know, I had memorized it and I was saying it and I was explaining it and it was sort of technical. And, and I, I did it a couple of times and I could see Bob out there sort of, you know, out in the fifth row in the dark, sort of looking up at the ceiling. And mm. I could tell it just was sort of like, mm, okay. You know, okay, that's a monologue about a guy who's telling you how to kill somebody. And I realized that we had to do something more. I said, this isn't working very good, is it? Mm. And I can't remember how we decided, but I, I, I did know that what what I think I said was, I think I, think I have to actually kill somebody in this. Hmm. You know, I think I have to pick somebody out there in the third row and kill the fucker hmm. with this knife. Because I have the knife in my hand, mm -hmm. this big old sort of knife. And uh, and he's talking about how you kill him and what happens when you put the knife in and what happens, in the, you know, when the blood comes out and all that stuff. And uh, And it was that moment when I made it personal. See, we, I, you're just two guys in a big empty space. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing that changes everything for an actor and a director is when living people come into that space. And all of a sudden, the play becomes something completely different. Yeah. And without them, it, it just sits there, and it's nothing. But with them, all of a sudden, I had a whole different attitude. When I first, well, I remember being able to walk out from backstage at the start of that show, and I walk out to the lip of the stage and stare out at the audience. Mm. And I'm in bare feet, you know, like a little prison gear. And, and I remember looking at that audience, and I remember being able at a certain point to control them from that moment on. Mm. You know, mm. in other words, they were in the presence of somebody they had no idea who they were with. Mm -hmm. And I could go anywhere after that. An actor, I just find that very profound. He, he discovered that he could come out to an audience, they have no idea who I am, and I can do whatever I want here. And he did have that power. People still talk about that show. People still talk about it. Um, Billy told me, he, he said, I have to get out of the CSI thing because I'm drifting too far from theater. And he wanted to go back to it. And he did a show in Toronto and was terrified but he wanted to go back to it. Um, just a couple more that are in sort of a different vein. Um, oh, I wanted to tell you this. Richard Christensen, the, the critic from the Tribune, famously talked about that show. There, there was a line in his review. Do you know what it was? It's, it's a famous line now. He said he was driving home in his review. He said he was driving home and he had to pull over his car because he was sobbing after seeing In the Belly of the Beast. And Richard is more reserved than that. So that became this famous line. And now, then it be turned into a kind of a joke because somebody will say, hey, Richard loved my play. And they say, but was it a pullover? So that's sort of gone with him now. But Richard's a wonderful man. Um, so George Webb. I was having fun. Whoop. And uh, then uh, there then was an opening in the resident company. and. Uh, 
they they called me, Bernie called me and, and said, come on in. You know, I was in Washington, D.C. visiting my sister, so I drove home and I was on, on, I was having fun. And sorry. Uh, then there was an opening in the resident company and uh, they, they called me, Bernie called me and, and said, come on in. You know, I was in Washington, D.C. visiting my sister, so I drove home and I was on, on cloud nine just driving home and and uh, I spent a year in the resident company That's and, and uh, 75 75 to summer of 75 to summer of 76 and uh, uh, and I then it came, all came crashing down I got fired in uh, summer of 76 early summer of 76 may I ask what that was about uh, it was for sucking basically <laughs> <laughs> uh, how were you told? Uh, Joyce and Bernie called me into their office. They told me uh, that I was playing it too safe and that they didn't want to get rid of me, but they wanted me to go back in the touring company. And, and, uh, did you see it coming? I mean, did you know you were sucking? or did? did... Um, yeah, I, I was sort of... Uh, I mean, I didn't see it coming really, but I knew I was a little bit lost up there. I, I didn't have a, a voice, a comedic. Uh, voice of my own. Later, I, I don't have time to, sh to share it with you today, but later he tells me the story of how he got the role on Cheers, which is a terrific story too. These are the slides that were supposed to play, <laughs> but I was having a technical difficulty. Gorbachev, George's Gorbachev. <laughs> Ed Asner, uh, Lou Grant, do you remember Lou Grant? I used to love that show, and Mary, he was on Mary Tyler Moore, and then he went off and did his own thing. But he's still acting to this day. He was just in, on Broadway with um, Michael Shannon in something. But I met with him in Tarzana, his, his home just outside of L.A., and this is a very different kind of story, a very different kind of moment. When he was part of the Playwrights Theater Club at the University of Chicago, um, we were talking about that, and I asked him about the first time his parents saw him perform. So this is his response to that. And there's a little, it's a, a melancholy in his voice that you'll notice. I love talking to this guy. I decided to, maybe one of my siblings had urged me to, to get them to come up to Chicago to see me act. Oh. So I waited until we did the Dibbuk. Yeah. And I played Rabbi Osrael in that. And they came at, up and stayed at the Lincoln Park Hotel. <laughs> and my dad gave me uh, certain pickups on, since I told him I was in charge of the cleanup. He found the banister at the back stairway to be too dirty, <laughs> too dusty. That was his pickup? He reprimanded me on that. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take care of that. What did he think of your acting? Well, uh, my mom is the one who quelled. Hmm. Uh, I don't recall him saying anything. Found out later that when he got back to Kansas City, that he told everybody that he, that I was played the age so well that. He wanted to get up on that stage and help me. Oh. So I thought that meant he approved. I would say. Mm -hmm. Huh. Did they, how much of your success did they get to see? Not enough. Um, I, the slides got messed up there. I apologize for that. Very oh, no. brief. Oh, I had a movie that was shown I at the Esquire the Theater. Jack again, and, about uh, his dad. And, and it had our name on, on the... Oh, no. oh, I had a movie that was shown at the Esquire Theater. And uh, and, and it had our name on, on the uh, on, out, on the outside. And, and I, I, I brought him down there. Hmm. He looked up, he'd look up and he'd see, cause we had the same name. You know, he was a Jack Wallace. I was a Jack Wallace. I never used a... The, the, the junior, you know, I just used Jack Wallace, you know, so. Was he proud to see the name up there like that when you showed him? 
Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. I put those two, I, I didn't get to introduce it, but I put those two together because that thing of wanting your father's approval is so interesting to me from these two kind of gruff exterior guys. But it meant a lot to Ed, you know. He didn't hear it until through a, a second party. And then uh, here's Jack Wallace, this tough guy, taking his dad to see his name up in lights on, on the Esquire Theater. I just, I just love that. I'm going to end this with, it's sort of a fatherly story, though it's not a real father. I'm going to end with this because it brings us kind of back around. Um, can you tell how far I rehearsed the most? And, and the, um, so it was seeing that second city review that sparked something for you. Yeah, I just watched it and I was like, I don't... I'm going to start that over because I wanted to introduce it. This is Katie Rich and... Katie Rich, she is, what, how old is she, Mary? We decided, like, 28? I, I think early 30s. Early 30s now. Katie Rich got, uh, saw a show, a Second City show, loved it so much, it's what she wanted to do. And you'll hear her say that. It's all I wanted to do. She quickly, at a young age, got into the touring company, then the resident company, and then she has this moment of, now what? Today she writes for Saturday Night Live. She writes uh, for Weekend Update. And her contract was just updated or uh, up, uh, renewed, so so she's doing okay. But I, I just love this little story, and it includes George. And we'll end with that. So it was seeing that second city review that sparked something for us. Yeah, I just watched it and I was like, I don't know what this is, but I this is all I want to do. Huh. And so then getting to do that and then being done with that at such a young age, there's... Done with? With Second City, like having oh. done the touring company and gotten to do main stage and, and gotten my dream, that, that was all I wanted. Um, it puts you in a very interesting place because... Hmm. It's like, well, now what? I mean, I'm not dead, and I have the vast majority of my life still to go. <laughs> and I already did. That's all I wanted to do was be on the Second City Chicago main stage. And I talked, I actually, as I was about to leave, as it was getting towards my time where I was leaving Second City, George Went came by because um, uh, Bernie had passed. And so we got the whole cast together to do a set with us. So like Bruce Jarko and his wife Nancy and just, it was really lovely. And um, George and I were sitting backstage and I remember he was having tequila because he'd had too much beer the night before. <laughs> and um, we were talking and I, I just kind of poured out exactly what I said to you. Like, I don't know what I want to do. I got my dream, that's all I wanted. And I didn't know about SNL at this time. And he just grabbed me and like hugged me and said, that's exactly how I felt. I was just this kid from the South Side and all I wanted was Second City. And then I got it and then it was like, well, I have no idea what I wanna do now. And he's like, and then I ended up sitting on a bar stool with the best writers in the world. And he's like, so it'll work out for you. And and it did, and so he holds such a special place in my heart for that moment, wow. which he probably doesn't even remember, but it, it really, he, it, it, that, that really just changed something on a cellular level for me as far as like, I'm not the only one that felt that way, and it will work out. I could easily base a whole talk like this around the intergenerational stuff that happens, the passing on. This would be a great clip for that. I just love her story. And it's so much of what happens in Chicago, not just at Second City, where people take the younger ones under their wing and then escort them into the, the theater world of Chicago. Thank you for being my inaugural audience. I really appreciate your, your giving me a chance to do this. The Court Theater uh, was, uh, I think, a going concern at the same time that the uh, Playwright Theater Company and its successes were. Um, as far as you know, how, what role did the Court Theater play in the 
genesis of the Chicago theater scene. Court the Steve, is my thing on? Uh, court theater came just a little later. Um, playwrights only lasted two years, if that. It was 53 to 55. And then court, is, is, I think what you're referring to is when they were outside. And that led to Nick Ruddle coming and doing directing there and doing some amazing things with the, the directors, including Bob Falls and Stuart Gordon and others. And that gave them a place where they could experiment and try things with, with an audience right there. In that way, it gave us Nick Ruddle and it gave us Stuart Gordon from uh, Organic and Bob Falls. He said it was the first time that Bob Falls had a chance to be huge, which was an interesting phrase. I think it played a, a significant role in that way. It's also the place where they were doing the classics. And they're doing Shaw and that kind of thing. They did some Pinter, but they were doing those plays, Electra. Whereas on, on the other part of the city, there was Bleacher Bums and you know, Steppenwolf Theater doing their kinds of things. So it played a significant role in that way. Does that, does that sound right to you? Yeah. Great. What a wonderful, fascinating program. I'm sure you have many more stories, and I hope you'll come back and continue to tell us some. I wonder if you can just wrap up quickly with the George Went getting the cheers role. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't tell it the way he, he does it, but um, he was called in to, to an audition, and he was given what, what's called sides, which is just your lines, and uh, all that said on there was one word. I said, what was the word? He said, beer. And uh, so they gave him that. And the character's name was George. But he thought, OK, it's just coincidental. He read for the part. And they said, well, no, let, let's have you do some more. And then he did some more, and he did some more. And then they cast him uh, as, as Norm. But the reason, though, he and he found this out only recently, a couple of years ago. He was sitting on a panel at something in, in California. And he was waiting backstage to come on. And some of the originators of the Cheers show were on stage. And George was supposed to come in as a special guest. And they asked, before George came out, they asked the guys who had created it, James Brooks and those guys, how was the casting? Did you always know that you were going to cast the way you? They, oh, no, it was terrible. We had so much trouble casting Sam and Diane. We searched around for everybody. You know, we, you know, we were looking for a chemistry. We couldn't find it. It took forever. We knew that Rhea Perlman, we wanted her. And we knew that George, we wanted him. And George said, what? That was the first time he, he knew. He said, I'm glad you didn't tell me at the time, because I would have fallen off my chair. But he was always meant for that role, which he didn't know until two years ago. Right yes? Um, so. A while ago, I took a tour at Second City where they share the area and they talk about its history. And the woman who gave the tour suggested that one of the great things that why improv in particular is successful here is because in Chicago, you're allowed to fail. It's not like New York where you have that one stage moment. And I'm wondering if you think that fits in with the narrative that you've been compiling about why we have so many great theaters and maybe some of them fail, but then they move on to do something else or I don't know if that would fit in with that. It's a brilliant question, and it's a brilliant and astute observation, too. That's exactly what I hear across the board. Um, people say, here in Chicago, you have license to give something odd a try. You know, And if it doesn't work, everybody forgives you, and you move on, and, and what's next? Steep Theater, which is this little theater that's doing wonderful stuff in Chicago, the uh, managing director of that told me, a subscriber came up to her and said, I don't like anything that you did this year, but I'd like to resubscribe. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of it, right? It's, I, I'll go take a chance with you. And I think that's part of the chemistry that made this a theater town, too, is the audience is in on it. Let's create this together and let us fail, because we'll be back next time. I clipped it out, but Nick Ruddle said something about John Malkovich um, auditioning like in his 20s for Shaw out at Court Theater. And he just looked like a fawn. He said he was horrible. This is not his kind of thing. And then he said, Steppenwolf did Shaw to disastrous effects. 
And then I said, but he, they tried? And he said, that's it, they tried. It's a, that's, I think that's a very astute observation. Uh, thank you for a great talk. I am curious, um, you didn't mention what American Stories Continuum is, and if it's um, an organization that is your work, I, I totally understand, but I'm wondering if you, you or that group, American Stories Continuum, how does it relate to StoryCorps that I hear on public radio, if at all, or was it inspired by that type of thing? A lot of things are inspired by StoryCorps. I, I was actually very inspired by Studs Terkel. I was interviewed by him in the 90s, and that really was an infectious moment for me. Um, American Stories, you're looking at it. It's, I've been doing interviews across the country with people, and then I store them on that website, and it is eventually what led to my getting a book. Because I interviewed the publisher, uh, Doug Seibold, if you know him, at Agate. Because I was looking for somebody who, uh, I wanted to interview somebody who had a small business that just took off beyond their wildest wishes. And on Facebook, a friend of mine said, you should interview my husband. And I interviewed him and he said, what else are you working on? And I said, I'd love to do something on Chicago Theater. We had dinner. So that's the relationship. No, no relationship to StoryCorps, except that I admire them greatly. Yes. Do you have anything to say about the contributions of actors with disabilities to the theater scene in Chicago? Yes. A great question, including, did, did everybody hear? Uh, insights into disabilities in, in Chicago theater. There's a woman named Susan Nussbaum. Do you know her? What is it? Mike. You know her father, Mike Nussbaum's father. Is it her father? Um, Susan, as a young woman, was studying acting at the Goodman, was walking to school, hit by a truck, and became quadriplegic in that moment. Goodman Theater, Frank Galati, actually, Tony. Goodman Theater, uh, Frank Galati hired her to play Gertrude Stein. And Frank said, to his knowledge, it was the first time that somebody in a wheelchair was cast not as somebody in a wheelchair. That was, and Susan did a lot of fighting for that kind of stuff because nothing was happening at that time. Now there's more and more and more. I'm, I'm just in the midst of working on a section on that. I wish I had more I could respond to you, but I'm gathering information and there's a lot happening right now. It's a, it's a good time for this. It's a good question. Yes, sir. Reflecting on the right to fail in Chicago, uh, there are a number of theaters that went out of business really in the 80s that nevertheless were very responsible for helping to build the audience in Chicago. I'm wondering if you have any particular research yet on the body politic theater, uh, the old St. Nicholas, and uh, the old town players and the old town triangle. It's a great question. I can, I can tell where, where your interest is, too. Um, Yes, I, I, as I said, this is very much in process. This doesn't come out until 2018, 2018, but this is what I do have so far. I've talked to Jim Shiflett, who worked with Paul Sills and, and opened Body Politic. I talked to him. Um, so I've got him. I've talked to Stephen Schachter from St. Nicholas. Bill Macy is coming up. Um, and other people who have come out of St. Nicholas. I'm a little more spotty there because I, I'm still filling it out. But that's where I am right now. And the short answer is yes, I'm, I'm definitely including that and have begun to work on it. Yes. Um, hello. I live Hi. on WBEZ. And ah. um, I hear more and more things about uh, the Moth Story Hour and the um, Story uh, Core yeah. people. And, it's, and I'm also crazy about theater. And it seems to me like perhaps these new forms of just everyday people getting up and telling their short stories is displacing what we used to have. We used to have LA theater works on Saturday nights and we used to have more long form things and even just stand up. But I'm wondering if you can comment on whether are we just finding a really inexpensive way to produce, you know, like reality TV is cheaper than scripted shows, right? So, yeah. you know, getting a bunch of amateurs unpaid and filling a lot of hours. But is that a threat to theater or is it a great supplement and perhaps gives a playwright some ideas about things to write about? 
Gosh, what a great question. The term great threat, I would say probably not. It's awfully big. Um, this, is, this, is, this would be my hope and this would be my guess combined. I think the, the theater, especially here, is so vibrant and they're always looking for new things and willing to take a risk. My guess would be if there would be a way to incorporate it. You know what I mean? Where some of these things would be incorporated into, into live theater and vice versa. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Again, I don't want to sound idealistic, but at the same time, uh, my wife and I see a ton of theater, and there's always it's always full. And I think that you're talking about two very different experiences, because when you go to the theater, you're there with a bunch of people, and that's it's that's its own reward. You're watching it with a bunch of people. You're reacting to it. They're reacting back to you. I think they're, they're two distinct experiences. I really do. Um, you were saying the, the community here is super cooperative. I was just wondering more about the sub ecosystems because I certainly was aware of Second City has kind of this feeder ramp to how you get in there and then you often end up on Saturday Night Live and stuff like that. Are there, you know, uh, tracks through the Chicago theater where the, the ones, very prominent ones at the top draw from the same places or is it really equal opportunity? If you're in Chicago, you just this got as good a shot to end up at the Goodman as from any particular place. Okay, again, you know, I, I'm early in this work, but let me tell you the impressions that I have from the people I've talked to. I have two thoughts on that. One is um, you, you look at some of the, some actors, I'm thinking of Heidi Kettenring, I'm thinking of Deanna Dunnigan, Linda Kimbrough, folks like this. You'll find them all over the place. Uh, Deanna, who is a Tony Award winner for August Osage County when it went to uh, to New York, just got a Jeff Award for a show that she did in Shattered Globe, which is this tiny, tiny place. There, there is this, there, the, Tony, you might be able to correct me on this, but there doesn't seem to be a hierarchy. There's, you know, everybody, uh, there's a sense that all of it is important work. And Deanna would love to work at Shattered Globe as well as to work at uh, Steppenwolf. If I put you on the spot, Tony, if, you, if I call on you? No, I, I think the, there are theater companies. They always have their core group of people. But there are a lot of floaters. People who floaters. don't marry themselves to a theater group and go wherever the work is. And there's so much available here. You can pick and choose what kind of or style of theater that you want to be in, participate in, or um, challenge yourself and go to the Shakespeare and go crazy. <laughs> It's great. Let me check this perception on you. My perception is there isn't a sense of someday by God I'll be at the Goodman. Or someday by God I'll be at Steppenwolf and I'll work my way up. The only uh, uh, theater I can think of that does that is that has that kind of vibe to it sometimes is Second City and now I.O. So improv. Beautifully put. Thank you. Um, I, thank you. Um, I, I'm trying to uh, understand where do you find the information about where all these theaters are and what they're playing, and uh, is there a source? Uh, I know the newspaper doesn't have anywhere near 250. <laughs> <laughs> um, online. And I, I just, oh, this, this will sound terrible. Facebook. I'm constantly seeing what's going on because I've, I've tapped into a lot of the theater people and they're always posting stuff about what's, what's going on. But the League of Chicago Theaters has a, has a site. 
There's um, hot ticks that will have everything listed too. There's an awful lot going on and well worth checking into. A friend connected me with somebody who was going to be coming to town. This was a friend of a friend. And she said, talk to Mark. He'll know what, what you should go see in the theater. And so the friend said, what should I see when I'm in Chicago? I'm like, you've got to help me here. There's 250 theaters. Are you Hamilton? Are you, do you want something in a small theater? You know, there's... You can't just answer that like that. So those uh, source those sources would be very good for it. In speaking about Second City and training, I was just wondering if part of your interview process included Sheldon Patinkin and his influence. Uh, she's she's talking about Sheldon Patinkin, who also goes back to Playwrights Theater Club and all the way all the way through. Um, very much a part of Second City, very much a part of Steppenwolf. Um, uh, Fran Guinan from Steppenwolf, I, I mentioned Sheldon to him. He said, I don't know if this is hyperbolic or not, but I think it comes close. He said, there isn't a theater in Chicago that has not been touched in some way by Sheldon Patinkin. I'm so sorry that I was not able to speak with him. He seemed so core. Anytime I mention Sheldon Patinkin, I say, did you know Sheldon? Oh, Sheldon is always the response. I was in LA interviewing some folks there and connected with a former student of mine. And she talked about uh, taking classes at uh, Columbia. And this is somebody who's, who's very young. And I said, did you know Sheldon? And she burst into tears. It's cross-generational. I, I have in the book, I'm working out several interludes which goes between the chronologies. But I'm thinking of dedicating one just to Sheldon. There's just so much. And there's so much that people want to say. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I'm just wondering if, with people's shortening attention spans, <laughs> what kind of impact that might have had on the theater? Wow. Well, you, you're asking somebody who's about to go to the five and a half hour tug of war, part two. Um, at Chicago Shakespeare Theater, um, has it? Give me a moment. Has it affected? I think. It, I think what we are seeing. I don't know if it's attention span or not, but we are seeing uh, a lot of visualness in theater. You know, a lot of things to r really arrest your attention. But at the same time, it's thrilling to go and just see two people in a drama, and it's just those two people, and it's just the drama. You know. I, I really don't feel positioned to comment societally on how that's affected the theater. Um, but I think it's an interesting question and something I should keep a, an eye out for. Because it is a different time. I've got it right here. Um, <clears throat> as a person who's been part of Chicago since uh, 1958, when I went to Goodman Theater as a student, and when they were papering the house, giving out free tickets to Second City, which was up north and was empty. So all of us students went. So Chicago theater was never about money because they didn't have any money. But anyway, I've been sitting here kind of not wanting to contribute because we want to ask you questions. And um, my question to you as somebody that lived through the theater through this whole era, um, what role do you know about what Actors' Equity played? Yeah. Because it was very important in the early years. There was very little space for local actors uh, to work. And there was only um, <clears throat> the Old Town Players and the Athenaeum Theater had a theater company, Theater First. And they called themselves semi-professional, but they were non-equity companies. And a lot of equity actors passed through there using false yeah. names yeah. To, in order to work in Chicago. So Chicago was not always so hospitable to Chicago actors as what happened later. So what do you know about that? It's, it, uh, it's another topic that I'm learning more and more about. I, I don't have a lot on it yet, but it's a significant thing to trace where uh, things began to change. Yeah. For actors' equity, building regulations began to change. Lort contracts, all that stuff dramatically changed. And I think, this is what I'm piecing together, it dramatically 
affected what was possible in Chicago because it opened things up. You know, um, it used to, because of the Iroquois fire, you couldn't, there were all sorts of building regulations. And uh, Playwrights Theater Club is called a club because if it was a theater, it would have other regulations, right? So you didn't buy a ticket to Playwrights Theater Club, you bought a membership. As that stuff began to change and they were allowing smaller theaters to do more things, right? And the equity camp contracts were changing to say, all right, for this one, we're going to do such and such. All that really changed what was possible. And I'm just beginning to track that, too. I think it's a very important thing. And it's clearly in there. Tony could probably talk to that better, too. All right. Um, is that? That wraps Thank up you. our questions. Um, thank you.